This week on the show, we've got continuing legal problems for eBay, a new return policy over at Amazon that has sellers concerned, and some problems with Etsy messaging. What is up, Galaxians? Welcome to episode number 236 of the Galaxy CDs, Rocks, and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. My name is Ryan, and I will be your host as we wade through some interesting reselling news in the first half of the show. And then, as always, in the back end of the show, we'll have some really interesting uh, and unusual things in the What Sold segment, uh, along with a little story time. (laughs) Uh, So buckle up, buttercups. Let's get right into this reselling news. News updates. So eBay uh, just continues to have one legal issue after another. Uh, This article is over on e-commerce bytes. eBay tells the judge it doesn't sell the items on its site. This is a defense they've taken before, but eBay told a federal judge on Monday it does not sell the items on its platform and therefore... The court should dismiss the lawsuit filed against it by the government in September on behalf of the EPA over the alleged sale of unlawful pesticides and high emission car parts. eBay had said at the time it would vigorously defend itself. Mind you, this is a different case than the one eBay settled with the government for $59 million just last month that involved the sale of those pill presses that we talked about that the government had alleged violated the Controlled Substances Act. In that case, eBay was forced to agree to provide the government with contact information of buyers and sellers associated with transactions tied to listings that violate eBay's new pill press dye and mold policy going forward. So they have apparently agreed to do that in addition to the fine. In a filing on February 9th, eBay pointed to Section 230, which has protected it in the past. They note the case Gentry versus eBay. Quote, the government's claims are also barred by Section 230 because they seek to hold eBay responsible for publishing third party listings. Section 230 states in part that, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. eBay has also argued they note that it does not sell the items in question for a simple reason. To sell means to transfer possession or title in exchange for a price, and the complaint does not allege that eBay owned or possessed these defeat devices. The government argued in its opposition to eBay's motion to dismiss filed on the same day that eBay is not, however, the innocent bystander that it purports to be. The complaint's allegations taken as true demonstrate that eBay participates in and controls every transaction on eBay. This is where it's going to get really interesting, and I'll be personally very curious to see how the court decides this particular issue. They say, among other things, that eBay actively markets the products listed on eBay.com prior to sale, including sponsoring certain items that they manage all aspects of the sales transaction, creating a virtual eBay shopping cart, accepting the purchaser's payment on an eBay payment page, processing that payment, taking a fee, paying the third-party merchant, and collecting and paying sales taxes and other regulatory fees. This is where I think things may be different this time around for eBay. eBay has successfully used this defense previously, but they did not do a lot of this stuff back in the olden times. Uh, But payment transactions were conducted by PayPal and they could plausibly deny that they had a lot of control over those transactions. But since they have now taken all of that stuff in house, this is going to, in my uh, non-legal opinion, present them with some potential uh, problems with this defense. They prohibit merchants and buyers from transacting business off of its site. It's one of their rules and it provides a money back guarantee in event the product is not delivered. It's an interesting issue. This article also adds, while two thir- Section 230 has long protected marketplaces, eBay has taken much more control over transactions now than in its early days. At what point will it bear legal responsibility for the items sold on its platform? So if you're watching on YouTube, you can leave me a comment down below. Uh, let me know what you think of all of that and uh, their ongoing legal woes and what you think of their defense. If you are, of course, listening to the podcast, you can always email me at galaxycds at gmail.com or DM me over on Instagram at Galaxy CDs Rocks. There are some additional changes uh, happening over at eBay. And uh, of course, my mouse just died. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> uh, man, technology. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, upcoming improvements to the authenticity guarantee process. So eBay had made an announcement last week that they were excited to share upcoming improvements making uh 
to the authentication process for the streetwear category. Our current streetwear authentication process includes two steps. Number one, authentication, and number two, listing accuracy. In some cases, items may be authentic, but our experts discover a discrepancy between the item and what was described in the listing. When this happens, eBay communicates to the buyer what the discrepancy is and gives the buyer the opportunity to either proceed with the transaction or return the item back to the seller. In this new experience, which is going to launch mid-February, both buyers and sellers will now be alerted when a discrepancy is found with details of the issues. For sellers, you're going to start getting notifications when a listing accuracy issue is found in both Seller Hub and via email. For buyers, listing accuracy details will be sent to your email along with new notifications in your purchase history and view order details pages. Again, asking you to provide a response from the new inspection details pages. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see kind of what some of this looks like. Uh, they launched this process in handbags back in September of last year. They're going to continue ramping up to other categories and markets in the first half of the year. I assume uh, sneakers will probably be a big one that they add this to. So if you sell in the streetwear category, know that there are some changes coming up to the Authenticity Guarantee Program. eBay kind of quietly announced and rolled this out some time ago. Now they have made a, a kind of a big official announcement. Cubic pricing is now available for USPS Ground Advantage and Priority Mail. Cubic pricing, if you're not familiar, is based on the size of the package instead of just the weight. That, this means it's even more important to include accurate weights and dimensions for your package so that eBay labels can generate the lowest rate for you. This has been the big selling point or one of them for Pirate Ship because they have had access to these cubic rates for a long, long time. And in many cases, they are substantially cheaper than the traditional rate. So in addition to commercial commercial pricing, these rates are even lower because they're based on the size of the package in addition to the weight. Uh, cubic rates will automatically display in eBay labels when the cubic price is lower than the non-cubic rate. For my own part, I'm not going to switch directly to using eBay labels. I'm going to continue to use Pirate Ship for a couple of reasons. Number one, in my case, I sell on multiple platforms through my use of List Perfectly, which I talk about pretty regularly on this show. If you're not cross-posting, you should. And if you'd like to look into List Perfectly, there is an affiliate link down below. It has been transformative for my business. But because I do that, I most days am shipping items on multiple platforms. So doing everything on Pirate Ship and getting it all done at one time on one site with one scan sheet to take to the post office is just much more convenient for me. If you're selling only on eBay or predominantly on eBay, this is a terrific option. It should happen automatically. I'm not aware of anything that you'll have to do since these new rates are in their system. They should just start populating. Uh, the other reason I'm going to continue with Pirate Ship is I make probably about $50 a month in cash back on the credit card that I use to pay for my nearly $2,000 a month <laughs> in shipping expenses. Uh, this is another change over at eBay that probably a lot of people weren't aware these were even really going on, which may explain why they've ended them. eBay has ended their monthly chats where it answered questions. Uh, they apparently ended it by just not showing up. <laughs> eBay didn't show up for their regularly scheduled month monthly chat session on Wednesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Leaving sellers wondering what was going on on Friday. Two days later, they announced... They're no longer going to host those monthly sessions. The chats, this article notes, were a throwback to when eBay held weekly chats, giving sellers an opportunity to ask questions about new features or problems they were having. In 2022, eBay transitioned from weekly chats open to any and all questions to monthly chats devoted to just a single topic, which of course was of eBay's choosing. In Friday's announcement on the selling board, for whatever reason, they did not post this news on the seller announcement board, so it was a little more difficult to find. eBay advised sellers to attend what will now be quarterly events known as the seller check-ins. I probably should go to those, but I have never attended one. Um, maybe I'll start doing that now that they're putting a little more emphasis on them. They say this way you'll be able to hear from eBay executives and staff and ask any questions you may have in real time. The next seller check-in is on March 7th from 2 to 4 p.m. So... Uh, if you were attending those uh, monthly chats and getting something out of them, I'm sorry, uh, they're gone. Uh, it will now be just the quarterly seller check-in. That's going to wrap it up for eBay. Moving on to Etsy. Uh, there was a change made, and I'm not, I'm not convinced it's necessarily on purpose. It's, I think it's just a mistake 
hopefully something that they can fix. But an unannounced Etsy change to messaging has backfired. Etsy sellers are buzzing about an unannounced change to its messaging system that has backfired, generating unintended consequences. A thread on the Etsy board explains the dilemma a buyer had when she discovered she was blocked from messaging a seller with whom she had placed a second order. Quote, I then placed another order this week and went to send the shop owner a message about when she could ship my items and was unable to send a message and an error popped up telling me that I'd been blocked. This is where it gets really problematic. If I go to the help center and try to open a case or request a resolution to a problem, it won't send the message. I've tried multiple ways to contact the seller about my current order and am unable to reach her at all. So there's no, no way to contact the seller if the seller has blocked you. You can continue to order from the seller, but you just can't message them. And apparently this is also tied to selecting spam on a message. If the seller notes a message that they've received as spam that automatically blocks that particular customer or user from messaging them in the future, which leads to these problems. This article goes on. The buyer is at a loss, unable to send a message to the seller, unable to respond to a question from the seller, and unable to even open a case. In fact, she can't even cancel the order. Sellers have surmised that Etsy has changed the way sending a message to spam works. Buyers can still place orders, as I just mentioned, from the seller, but they can never again message a seller who placed one of their messages in their spam folder. Uh, to the uninitiated, it says it might seem puzzling, A, why a seller might put a message in spam if they don't really have a problem with the buyer, and B, why Etsy would permablock a buyer from messaging a seller but continue to let them purchase from that seller. That, to me, is also a problem, <laughs> uh, but that's neither here. The, the answer to question A is that in order to qualify for the Star Seller Program, which I talked about last week, a seller must reply to all first messages received from a buyer or a potential buyer. Sellers quickly figured out that if they just mark the message spam, they won't be penalized. I talked about that last week in the case of the scams. So this is an area where that could cause an issue. If it is a legitimate customer that you'd like to have contact with and you've actually marked it as spam, now you're not going to be able to communicate, or at least they're not going to be able to communicate with you. Uh, according to discussions in the seller forums, Etsy made the change as early as late last week, but as is a kind of the the situation over there, they did not announce it. It's a problem between reputable buyers and sellers, but it could also be proved to be a boon for scam sellers, according to an e-commerce bytes reader. This is a huge blessing for scammers. Someone places an order for your crappy widgets. They say you immediately block them so they can't open a case for your widgets and boom, you win because there's no way for them to open a case. You just take their money and go on with life. So this could really be a problem. On Wednesday afternoon, an Etsy moderator said they would look into the matter, but there's no sign of an update as of this reporting that the issue has been resolved. So keep an eye on that. If you are a seller or a buyer on Etsy and you've run into this, you can let me know again down in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, but this could be kind of a mess. Over on Amazon, sellers are worried about a new return policy. Amazon announced a new return policy that has sellers worried over potential abuse by buyers who can now request an instant replacement for their purchases. If a buyer receives an item that is damaged, defective, or different from what they ordered, they may be able to select a free instant replacement during the returns process, Amazon announced on Thursday, giving sellers literally only days to adapt to this new policy that takes effect on Monday. Because the returns go through Amazon's prepaid return label program, the company will know if the buyer doesn't ship the package back to the seller. According to this new policy, buyers are required to return the original item within 30 days of receiving the replacement. And Amazon said sellers would be eligible for automatic reimbursement if buyers fail to do so. In addition, they say uh, sellers can file a safety claim if the buyer returns an item that was used, damaged, or different from what was sent. Amazon explained in their announcement that this with this change, buyers will have a consistent process for returning products across all our fulfillment options. One seller, however, noted that all of their replacement orders are because the buyer ordered something incorrectly and they either want a different size or a different color. They say that under this new policy, the seller said those customers won't be satisfied since they'll still receive the exact same item they originally received. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I, I would... I would hope that Amazon is pretty clear that if you request this instant replacement, that you are going to get the exact same item. And this is probably a big leap of faith on my part, that customers are smart enough to know that if they've ordered the wrong size or the wrong color, they don't want the exact same item. But uh, that probably is too big of a leap <laughs> of faith 
on my part. The seller went on to say, why not listen to the Amazon customers and Amazon sellers and just keep it simple. Return for a refund. So again, if you're a seller over on Amazon, you can let me know what you think of their new return policy. And the last little bit of news, this probably won't affect a ton of people, but it it adds to a growing list of countries that the United States Postal Service has suspended service to. Uh, USPS suspends all mail and package services to the Central African Republic, effective on February 16th. They've suspended acceptance of most common mail services to the Central African Republic. They say you should not be able to drop packages off that are going to that country you may want to go in if you're on eBay and add Central African Republic to your exclusions list so that you don't accidentally accept an order from that country. I don't know how much ordering goes on from this particular country, but you don't want to get caught in a situation where you're selling something to a place that you cannot ship to. They say postage refunds for shipments entered into the mail stream after the start of the suspension are available. It affects the following mail classes, Priority Mail Express International, Priority Mail International, First Class Mail International, First Class Package International Service, International Priority Air Mail, International Service Air Lift, and M-Bag items, which I don't know what that even is. <laughs> Uh, service suspensions to a particular country do not affect the delivery of military or diplomatic mail. So if somebody is, I don't know if we have any bases in Central African Republic that an APO address might apply to, but they will, uh, those will still be good. They have advised that International Service Center employees will endorse items, mail service suspended, return to sender, and place them in the mail stream for the return to you should you accidentally drop something off in a mailbox or whatever and it gets processed through their system. So just be aware of that. Might be something that you want to add to your exclusions list if you can. Uh, again, I don't know how often people actually ship to the Central African Republic, but in case you do, now you can't. With that, let's get into some what's sold. So it was quite a week uh, here at the Galaxy. I, I actually was on the road for three days last week doing some sourcing, a story we'll get into here in a little bit. Uh, so I didn't really do as many listings as I normally do, which still for me is probably a, a lot compared to some others. I did 100 new listings and sold 87. We're going to hit some of the high points here as we usually do this first item sold over on eBay. First Love by Dorothy Black. It's a hardcover with its dust jacket from Penn Publishing, an ex-library copy from 1940. Uh, I had this listed, I believe, for $29.99. It is part of a sale I'm running, and it sold for $20.99 plus media mail shipping. This is a book I had picked up in a book of kind of vintage romance novels from the 20s 30s and 40s probably two years ago maybe even a little longer than that so i've had this thing for a long time if you're watching on youtube you can see the dust jacket while present is not in the greatest condition there's some tears and rips and a hole and it's faded but it's still for a book that's whatever 80 plus years old having its dust jacket added some value this thing twenty dollars and 99 cents i own it for a dollar uh, this is another one that I picked up at an estate sale. Bunch of uh, African American history and religious books. I own these all for a dollar. This was called They Stole It, But You Must Return It. Written by Richard Williams back in 1986. Published by Hema Publishing as a paperback book. Fairly hard to find. Had it listed for $24.99. Sent out an offer of 15% off and sold this thing for $21.24. You will notice I've got a new, trying a new format, trying to make these what solds look a little more prominent on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. One of the things I've found that eBay just does screwy things with, if I send out an offer, when I pull up my sold listings, they still show the original price. If you send me an offer, it strikes out the price that they paid for it, even though that's the accurate price. There's a lot of inconsistency. <laughs> Uh, with how eBay displays sold items on their sites. So I'm not I'm not totally sure how I want to do this yet, but you can let me know what you think of this new look again if you're watching on YouTube. Moving on, uh, I talked about this big purchase that I did a couple of months ago of a bunch of Seventh-day Adventists religious books. This is one of those, the Seventh-day Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine from 1957. 
Another one published by the Review and Herald, hardcover with its dust jacket, actually in really good condition for a book of that age. This sold on eBay for $22.99 plus shipping. I own it for $2. Another book from an estate sale that I own for a dollar, Rachel L. Carson, The Sea Around Us. This was uh, an Oxford 1951 first edition, first printing. Hardcover with its dust jacket. These not first printing sell pretty regularly for five, six, seven dollars. This one being a first printing commanded a little more money, twenty three ninety nine plus shipping. Moving over to Etsy, the Holy Bible, New American Bible, Rembrandt edition, uh, illustrated hardcover from nineteen seventy three. This was part of another big lot of religious books that I own for two dollars a piece. This sold for twenty four ninety nine plus shipping. A uh, little bit of history from 1966, The International Nomads, Today's Jet Age Society, written by Len Franco Rasponi, a hardcover with its dust jacket, again, in reasonably good condition. This sold on eBay for $24.99. This was part of one of the big buys that I did. I own this book for 16 cents. Uh, I talked about the sale uh, last week that I went to that I bought a lot of the kind of horoscope, astrology, tarot books. This is another one of those that I own for a little over a dollar. Um, tarot and the Journey of the Hero by Hajo Banzoff from 2000, a first printing paperback. Had it listed for $34.99 plus shipping. Sent out a 15% off offer to a watcher and sold it for $29.49. So here's a we're, here's the little story time we're going to do. So I looked up uh, local estate sales on Wednesday of last week, and everything appeared to be happening on Thursday. So Thursday I was on the road. I went out and I hit some sales. Didn't really do very well. I picked up 50 or 60 items, so not, not a great day. Friday morning I get up, I do my orders, and I decide I'm going to go on the sites and see if maybe there's anything new that dropped in. And I found one on Garage Sale Finder in Cincinnati, about a 25-minute drive from where I'm at, that there were in the photos boxes and boxes of what appeared to be anime and manga and anime DVDs and game guides and that sort of stuff just kind of strewn everywhere. So I decided to take a flyer and go down to this sale. And man, am I glad I did. <laughs> uh, so I picked up uh, 79 items. I think it was 31 DVDs, 31 books, a handful of comic books, and a, a piece of framed art. art. Uh, I had a, a big, big pile, and I told the, the clerk that was working the desk, I'm going to go out and get one of my Rubbermaid tubs. You work me up a total. I was fully prepared to spend $100 on the pile of stuff I had there. And I walked back in, and the woman says, how about $40 for everything? <laughs> and I'm like, how about it? That's outstanding. So I ended up... Uh, into a bunch of this stuff for roughly 50 cents a piece. And I listed the first 10 items from that lot when I got home. I've already sold three of them, which you are gonna see here today on this What Sold recap. But the upshot of it is I spent $40 and I've already done $130 roughly in sales off that lot with just 10 items listed. This is the first one of those that has sold Care, the complete series DVD episodes one through 12. This is a two disc set from uh, Funimation. Had it listed for $39.99, got an offer almost immediately for $35. And because I own it for 50.2 cents or whatever it worked out to be, uh, went ahead and sold this thing and shipped it out immediately. Here's an old CD. I have had this thing. Oh, man, since I did that big 8,000 plus CD lot buy, which is coming up on five years ago now, uh, Duster 1975, this was new and sealed. It's an EP from 1999 on Up Records. I had this thing listed for $74.99, but because I've had it for so long, it's been on sale at pretty steep discounts. I own it for like three and a half cents and it sold for $47.99 plus shipping. So if you're out and about, this is a slow seller to be sure, uh, but it's worth some pretty good money. Uh, the artist is Duster and the album or the EP is 1975. 
Another weird book from a big lot of books that I own for about four cents. Uh, Weeds of Southern Turf Grasses, Golf Courses, Lawns, Roadsides, and Recreational Areas. This was a paperback book about weeds and weed control <laughs> from like the early 1980s. Again, it was in a big lot, just in a box of books. I looked this thing up and lo and behold, it had a lot of value. I had it listed, I think, for $44.99 or best offer. I received an offer of $40 plus shipping and went ahead and sold this thing. Here's one I picked up just a week ago at an estate sale. I took a chance on this. I listed it at auction because the comps on it were spread pretty wildly. It's The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. This was from 1983. It is a very, very difficult to find first U.S. edition, first printing. Almost everything else that was listed currently were book club editions of this. Nobody that I could see had a first printing but I'd seen these first printings selling anywhere from 30 to almost $100. So I put this thing at an auction starting at $49.99 and hoped for the best. As it turned out, it got a few watchers, but only one bid, $49.99, which is still pretty good because I bought it for a <laughs> dollar. Uh, back to that estate sale where I picked up all the anime and stuff. This is a very, very difficult to find DVD. Fighting Foodons, Prepare for Battle, Complete Series DVD by Discotech in its slipcover. These things are selling not super fast because there's just not very many of them out there, but I've seen them sell for as low as $25 and as high as $100. So I listed mine at $99.99 or best offer. Almost immediately got an offer for $93. Again, I'm into it for just a touch over 50 cents. I've owned it for less than 24 hours, so I went ahead and took that deal. Uh, if you see one of these out in the wild, definitely grab it. There is still money in DVDs if you get the right ones. This one was the Fighting Foodons. It's from the early 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. I had never heard of this show. I've never seen this show, but as soon as I looked it up and realized there weren't any listed and found some sold comps, I decided to add it to my stack, and I'm glad that I did. And here's your flip of the week, also from that same sale, from the same lots, from the same 50-odd cents. Uh, another of the Sakari. this one is Pure Engagement. This is episodes 1 through 13 with OVA and extras. It's a 3-DVD, 2-Blu-ray box set. This one took some research because there are multiple different versions of this that are out there. Some of them are DVD only. Some of them are Blu-ray only. Some of them are in different packaging. I finally landed on a price of $99.99 plus shipping on this, again, from 50.2 cents or whatever it worked out to be, uh, and another one that sold within two days. So if you're out and you see anime, it is definitely worth taking a look at, especially these Sakari uh, series of Japanese anime. They were absolutely fantastic. 100 bucks and 35 for the other one it essentially tripled my money from my initial investment, and I've still got... 70 odd items probably <laughs> 65 items left to list from that particular buy so uh the moral of the story i guess is it pays to double check and make sure that you've caught all of the sales and even on a day where you don't feel like going out sourcing uh if you see some cool stuff it's probably worth the trip this one was absolutely outstanding uh and that's going to put a wrap on this week's show if you got anything out of this if you could do me a favor and whack that thumbs up button if you're watching on youtube if you're not currently a follower of the podcast or a subscriber on YouTube, you can consider doing that as well. Please feel free to share this with any of your like-minded reselling friends as well. And as always, I thank you for spending a little bit of your time with me on uh, episode 236 of the show. I had somebody that reached out and commented, wow, 235 episodes of this. <laughs> and I kind of had the same thought myself. I'm like, man, I have spent a lot of time in this basement in front of this microphone. But I, I hope you get something out of it. I hope you find it useful and uh, you've gotten a few tidbits and learned some things. So with that, I'm going to close for, the, for this week. We will see you next week. You have been listening to the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will catch you again next time.